All right, great. And, and I should introduce uh, Sipur Tap, Mary Medical College. I'm the director of bioinformatics, and I'm a co-chair uh, of the Anvil ECC. Um, my favorite band is Nirvana. And um, uh, I think I've cut into some time. So uh, we'll get some presentations from uh, Brian O'Connor from The Broad, and then from Fred Tan from Carnegie, who's also the one of the senior project managers on Anvil. So um, why don't we uh, just go ahead and cut to that? So uh, Brian, uh, Brian, you, you yeah, actually, I think that that was a cover slide from the previous present, uh, previous uh, sessions, and so it's. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Jeff. Yes, 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 please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries, no worries. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm very happy to tell you about outreach and training. It's um, uh, a particular passion of us on the Anvil Project, and I am excited to tell you what, what we've been up to. As you heard earlier, there's a lot of sort of excitement around the Anvil, and then there's a lot of questions around how do we get it into people's hands. So next slide, please. So a little outline, I'm gonna talk about our mission and then I'm gonna hand it over to our colleague, my colleague Tiffany from the Broad Institute to talk about awareness and asynchronous support. And then I'll come back and tell you a little bit about some of the other support we're doing um, and then the goals for uh, our outreach group for the future. So next slide. So our mission is really to develop scalable training support and incentives to make it easier for the scientific community to adopt and use the Anvil platform. I mean, the real incentive is to try to get people to use a cloud-based tool that's really helpful for democratizing access, but can be a little intimidating when you're moving from using computers on your laptop to using computers on the cloud. Next slide. So the hope is if we build it, then people will come and, and use this tool and get excited about it and, and use it. But, but we know that there's going to be some challenges. We know that it's actually kind of not just that we can build it and that people will easily show up. Next slide. Um, there are many amazing things. You've heard about a lot of them earlier today. There's data sets you can't get anywhere else. There's computing power to do everything from R to Python to Galaxy. You can share analyses quite easily and you can scale up analyses. I'm showing a graph here of Mike renting more computers than it makes me sweat just looking at that graph. Um, and so those are all incredible aspects of it. Next slide. So yes, it's extremely exciting. We're super pumped up about it, but then there's some challenges too. So next slide. So there's some barriers to adoption. So making people aware of Anvil and its capabilities, overcoming hurdles like nervousness about billing and security and, and really a new way of thinking when you're working on the cloud, training people to use the cloud, how to manage people on this infrastructure, how to manage data. It's a lot for people to learn. And then providing support to diverse communities because we think the real power of a tool like this is that its ability to democratize access to computing um, and genomics for a much larger cross-section of researchers around the US and new researchers and students and everyone else. Next slide. So we don't want people thinking like this, frustrated at their computer when they're trying to figure out how to use these new cloud computing tools. And so a lot of our work is to try to make, make it easy for people to use. Anvil is renting computers. It's sort of, you're out there trying to sort of select, um, you know, use computers in a way that's a very different than what people usually do. They buy a computer and then they just use it. With cloud computing, you rent a computer over a period of time. And so it's kind of a, a stressful thing for people who aren't used to that to start. Next slide. So our team for outreach so far has been consisted of two groups, a centralized group that does user research, content development, some funding support, things like that. I'm gonna tell you about a lot of that too. And then a decentralized team that incorporates the training groups of Bioconductor, Galaxy, the Bro Institute and Terra to basically support a really broad cross-section of users who are trying to move onto this cloud computing platform and get excited about it. Next slide. So I'm gonna now go a little bit to our uh, approach um, and I'm gonna hand it off here, I think on the next slide to uh, uh, Tiffany, who's gonna take over um, to talk about uh, a little bit uh, of the first part of our activities and I'll hand it over to you, Tiffany. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. Okay, so yeah, I will go ahead and start talking about um, the activities for training. So they are modeled after the Caesar acquisition funnel on the slide, going from awareness to loyalty. And so I'll start with awareness and then asynchronous support, and then I'm gonna pass it on to Jeff to finish off. Next slide, please. Okay, so awareness. So we need to make sure that people can find out about, about Anvil and, and the ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a few approaches to doing this. And one approach obviously is through blogs and uh, pushing, uh, pushing that content out to people. So this is just a quick table of 
uh, blog posts that were specifically about Anvil and highlighting different feature features of Anvil from Terra.bio. And basically the Terra team has this blog um, and it reaches wide a wide community of folks for from the Terra communities and Anvil communities. And just wanted to, to provide um, some, some view numbers here too, so you can kind of see, um, see what that looks like. Um, and I'll just point out that uh, the most popular one was about RStudio. And within that blog post, there was a demo of using RStudio with Bioconductor um, and Anvil powered by Terra. And then you can see also two other blog posts uh, announcing Galaxy. Um, the last blog post was about uh, was actually a guest blog post from Dr. Martin Morgan about Bioconductor and the Anvil R package and why we need the Anvil R package. So um, they're, they're great posts for announcing what's happening. Um, next slide, please. Um, another awareness tool is using social media. So the Anvil has an active Twitter presence and uh, the Twitter is used to announce training events and to make people aware of awesome work that's being done on the platform. Next slide. Okay, now I'm gonna switch over to asynchronous support. Um, next slide, please, thank you. So now, um, you know, you, you make users aware of Anvil, they're getting started using Anvil, they have questions. And so to kind of react to how to support the ecosystem, the Anvil discourse page, which you can see here, it's a forum, um, was created to, to help, um, uh, you know, Get, get answers to users in a scalable way. So basically it's like a, a other forums where you know, users can connect with each other, they can see each other using Anvil, they can answer each other's questions. And the idea here is to, to help scale support with a small team. Next slide, please. So there's also um, actually when you're using Anvil powered by Terra, there's also other channels that you can use too for, uh, for help. There's an in-app widget um, that you can use to contact us module essentially where you can send um, you know, questions about the workspace you're working on right there in a screenshot. And so uh, there's also a forum available uh, from the portal Anvil Powered by Terra for very Terra specific questions. And there's also email if, if people are shy and don't wanna post their questions publicly. The next slide, please. Okay, so we just talked about kind of how people can get support, but also asynchronous support means you know, people want to onboard, you know, self-service. They don't want to have to, to necessarily like talk to somebody to learn how to do something. So um, through, uh, through providing persona oriented training materials, um, that is some, a way to kind of minimize the noise among all the training materials and develop things that are specific for each persona. So we see PIs, analysts, consortia, teachers. Next slide, please. And one really great example uh, of a persona-driven um, pieces of documentation um, you can see here are the budget, status, uh, budget justification templates and the Anvil cost estimator. So those are made available in the investigators section and investigators can you know, adapt these materials and actually people really like them and, and the NIH um, cloud platforms are interested in uh, making these more accessible as well. And Jeff is gonna actually talk more about the Anvil Getting Started Guide uh, 1.0 and some other upcoming uh, materials that are getting planned for self-service. So with that, I will, next slide, pass it on to Jeff. Awesome, great, thanks very much. Yep. Um, next slide. Um, so we have been developing an educational technology platform for a while at Johns Hopkins, in part supported by Anvil, that basically allows us to create open source content in the same way that you do sort of agile software development and then publish it in multiple places on the web and through various different massive online open course platforms so that people can, we get the maximum impact for the course content that we develop for asynchronous learning. Next slide, please. So we started off by developing an Anvil Getting Started Guide 1.0. It's available right now at this URL. It's also being integrated into the portal with collaboration with the portal team that basically helps people get started in all the hard stuff, you know, getting your billing account set up, how to work with workspaces and share data and things like that. So it's a really exciting resource that's really targeted to specific users that in their personas so that they can figure out how to get up to speed and get started as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. So then we also have been providing synchronous support. Next slide. 
Um, we've <laughs> supported a large number of events. It's been a, despite our relatively small, like centralized team, we have a pretty big and distributed uh, decentralized outreach group. And so we presented at a wide variety of conferences and uh, events and provided synchronous sort of activities so that people can participate. Um, including the Magic Jamboree, which we hosted, which was really successful and had a number of consortium members participate. We have a bunch of events planned for the upcoming year as well. So we're really exciting to, to get really interactive with people. Next slide. We also have Anvil office hours, which we've initiated, which basically gives people an opportunity to show up and talk to the Anvil outreach chain directly, ask their questions, get them responded to with a bunch of experts on a Zoom call all at once. So it's a lot more quick and easy response if you're sort of a little nervous about asynchronous sort of support. Um, so this is a great opportunity and we're highlighting it on help.anvilproject.org, which is the community that we've been building to try to get people excited about Anvil. And so you can, if you sort of go to that website, you'll be able to find out when we announce these Anvil office hours. Next slide. Um, and we also give some tailored support to very specific communities in order to try to build bridges and, and sort of support a more democratic access, uh, access to cloud computing. So one of those is through this AC2 program. The AC2 program is a cloud computing credits program that's been administered by the outreach team um, with some external reviewers who have provided a lot of assistance. And they selected a number of pilot projects that got cloud credits so that they could get onto the Anvil and not have to put their own credit card down and could actually start trying it out and doing some really cool science. These are some of the examples of the projects, but that program is scheduled to sort of scale up and provide us more opportunities to get people onto the platform since billing is usually one of the sort of big barriers for people joining onto a cloud platform. This is a cool way to sort of move people onto the platform without having to worry about that sort of uh, stress. Um, and we plan to think of creative ways to support that going forward. Next slide. We also have been working with this genomic data science community network, which you've heard a little bit about. This is something that we're really excited about. Um, this is, I think, really illustrates in a real way the power of something like the Anvil. We have a, a number of colleagues and collaborators at institutions all over the US who are outstanding scientists and biologists and computer scientists who are we're working with to develop curricula from them, you know, developed by them that we can share and support students as they grow genomic data science at a variety of institutions, not just the Hopkins and the Broads of the world. And so it's, it's really exciting to see what, what's going on with that. Next slide, please. So the, that uh, has had its kickoff meeting and its first symposium, and we're working on the second symposium now, and it's been a super high energy event. So there's some people on call here today that are participating in that, and it's just been super fun, just a really great group of people. Next slide. Oops, is it advancing for other people? Okay, and then we're doing user research. Next slide. So we're collecting data and analyzing the data about who's using the Anvil on Anvil. And so that's kind of a meta approach to user research, but it's giving us opportunities to discover what are the different ways that tools are being used and, and how to support them. Next slide. And we're also doing what we call deep pilots, which is working individually with individual researchers and educators to figure out what are their pain points as they try the platform out. What are the things that are stressing them out? What are the things that make it easy or hard for them to use the platform and collecting data on that qualitatively? Next slide. And so our goal in the future going forward is to build a big, happy, diverse, vibrant Anvil user community that helps each other out, supports each other through help.anvil.project.org and also can use the platform to do a whole host of things that you couldn't do before. Next slide. And so just looking a little bit towards the future, we're trying to think of how do we actually um, develop this sort of uh, community of people. You know, we, we built this incredible resource. It's, it's still getting developed as it goes forward. So we're thinking about how do we scale up our asynchronous support? How do we scale up our synchronous deep training efforts? Um, how do we continue to develop content and tools that can support platform changes? The platform changes over time. And so, uh, you know, we need to be able to adapt our resources, our training resources to an adapting platform, which is obviously a big challenge. And so that's something we're thinking a lot about with our ed tech platform. And then build the Anvil community through GESCN, through our outreaches to clinical co collaborations and working groups, through, through Anvil discourse, and through bringing these different communities together, the Galaxy community, the Bioconductor community, the Terra community. And then really one of the things that we're most excited about for the future is to really leverage our user research, the things we're identifying that are pain points with the platform and really feed that back in 
to um, improving the process for people, the user experience for people as they adapt this platform. You know, it's it's an incredible tool. It has a lot of power to it. It's it's really a, an amazing accomplishment what we've built. But if we can't make it really easy for users to use, uh, to adopt, and to use, and to be supported on, then it will be a real challenge to get for people, and people will be frustrated as they get on. So we're really excited about trying to find ways to leverage the things that we're learning from our users to improve the platform. And with that, I think I will, uh, uh, I think we've uh, done with our presentation. Looking forward to the discussion. Great, uh, thank you, Jeff and, and, uh, and, and Tiffany. Um, <clears throat> I think we're actually a little bit ahead of time. Um, so just let me, uh, um, most of us were in the, the previous uh, session. So I think um, rules are, are, are fairly uh, well uh, outlined, but um, we'll spend about 10 minutes on each of the SWAT um, uh, discussion topics, and, and certainly we can, you know, uh, mix and match as we need. Um, if you go ahead and just raise your hand, um, you know, uh, as, as a primary, and then um, everyone has the ability to unmute as well. So I think um, that said, we will uh, probably just get into, you know, 10 minutes to do strengths, 10 for weaknesses, and, and so on. So um, I think we'll just open it up for that, unless, Chris, there's anything else to do before we get into SWAT. No, we can um, maybe ask the discussants in particular to um, provide their thoughts. Great, and I apologize. Did we miss any discussants uh, previously, or, or uh, uh, some changes from from before? Uh, if so, uh, please, yeah, um, uh, let, let let me know that. Um, otherwise, we will uh, go ahead and go. So, why don't we start with strengths? And um, I think obviously there will be some overlap from the previous session because there's a lot of. Uh, overlap going on with with this uh, you know with, with these different um, functions, um, but can we can we start with the strengths of Anvil perceived or uh, experienced from from this group? Yeah, at risk of maybe. Oh. Go ahead, uh, Andrew. Go ahead, and then and then we'll get to Bill. Uh, very quickly, at risk of being repetitive, I was in a different group prior, and one of the big things that's rather obvious, you don't have to have big outlays of money, easy to just use a cloud resource, and uh, the democratization, you can reach the Midwest. The theme that came up in the last session was the silos on the coasts and a flyover country maybe that's overlooked, and Anvil can reach those. Awesome. And by flyover country, like you're being euphemistic, but um, I, I, I am. It, it, I, I grew I, up in St. Louis and yeah, so that's me. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to talk about that quite a bit. Um, Bill, go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, I think that the, if I understood it correctly, the deep pilots program is, is, is a real plus, I think, uh, where, where you can get that intimate interaction with the users and get them involved uh, directly in, in using the, 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 the tool. So, so um, uh, let me ask a question about that. Is that, I don't know if I picked this up, was that primarily aimed at faculty, students, postdocs, or what, the Deep Pilots program? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's it's actually, we're trying to hit a few different communities with that, though. So we're trying to hit the, the researchers, sure, but we also have grad students who are actually using the platform day to day and trying to figure out what their pain points are. We sort of, that persona model is sort of a way to think about it. We've got grad students, we want to talk to some PIs and how do they set up their lab and how do they sort of manage the costs and then educators, how do we run this in a classroom and how do we make sure that it works well for them? So sort of thinking through that, that deep pilots program is to collect information from all of those different communities, to try to figure out what are the pain points for each one. Yeah, I, I think that's, the deep pilot, I think it's a really good idea. Uh, I, I think it has the potential to uh, uh, demystify uh, 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 Anvil, but while it's, it's being de demystified, it's also uh, exposing its strengths to the people. And, 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 and so I, I think that's, that's something should be uh, exploded. Uh, one other question, I, I didn't know what this meant. What do you mean by Anvil discourse? What, what is that? Yeah, absolutely. We can paste the link here, help.anvilproject.org. If you go there, it's a community. It's sort of a, a, a place where you can post questions and get answers. Okay. So one of the big challenges of the Anvil is because it's, Mike is actually the one that pointed this out. The Anvil is, you can think of it more like a computer that has lots of apps on it, right? You can launch R, you can launch Galaxy, you can launch Python. 
you can do things on Terra. Each of those has their own support community. Each of them has their own sort of development of, of, of places where you can get answers to questions. We're trying to build a community around this website where people can go and they post their questions. And then our outreach team often ends up like shuttling that question. <laughs> Tiffany can tell you about Fred posting questions to the, to the Terra uh, help support ticketing system, for example. Um, so we try to like be the, you know, to use the analogy where it looks all smooth on the surface. You ask your question and regardless of what it's about, you get an answer on help.anvilproject.org. And then the, we're the duck with the feet underwater running really fast, trying to figure out where that's supposed to go and, and getting you your answer back. So it's sort of a, our goal is to build a one-stop shop around all the different tools and get, as we get more users, if they continue to join this, the hope is the Galaxy group and the Bioconductor group have done this incredibly well. They've developed these communities where, people will answer each other's questions. You know, we stop answering the questions because somebody else already knows the answer and they, they, they post it. So we're hoping to get there eventually. Thank you. Great. Uh, John, please go ahead. You have your hand up. Yeah, hi. Uh, again, as I said uh, earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I ran a virtual data uh, science training program over the uh, spring and then Jeff and uh, Mike, they were all there to support us. And then, uh, I mean, it was a very successful uh, program. We had an average of over 70 participating uh, each week. And then, of course, the Anvil team uh, exposed the participant to the various uh, uh, tools that they had. And then another trend that I see is uh, they also uh, give all the participants uh, credit to be able to use the resource. I don't know if they did that to only as if they do it to everyone, but I think that is a great uh, uh, strength to uh, expose uh, students and researchers to, to un un uh, unveil. Great. And I, want, I just want to be sure, like, we parking lot that discussion about the credits, because that'll also pretty much figure into the weaknesses, um, not the fact that... Oh, that's that's really but, but well, if, if you get it for free, then that, that's a threat. Yeah. But of course, yeah. if you are paying Absolutely. for it, then that, that would be a weakness. That's why I said if they did it for us or they do it for everyone. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have a discussion of costs in, in, in later sections for sure. All right. Good point. Um, I, I did a, a, ask a question, uh, John, to you. Like, so uh, what, you, what you worked on with, um, with, with Jeff and, and Mike, is that part of Howard's... Um, yeah, yes. Program? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, and, and oh, well, it was uh, an eight-week data science uh, training. So initially, we were going to do it only for Howard students or RCMI or institutions with RCMI, but we extended it to other HBCUs, and then once we advertised it, we we're get getting a. Uh, uh, participants from everywhere, students, researchers, faculty, even some of them tenured faculty, they were all there. Some of them even from overseas, I think in the other session, there were issues with security issues for overseas. Uh, yeah. yeah, so there were actually people coming from Europe, from Africa, for, uh, from everywhere. So it was more like an overview of data science started with Python, some basics of statistics, neural uh, machine learning, deep learning, and then we had a special session for Anvil. That is where uh, Jeff and Mike and uh, his team, the whole team uh, were there for over two days. So we're very appreciative of that. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think want to talk about that some more. And especially like me being from Harry, you know, another, you know, historically black college where there's a need. Um, just yeah, yeah, hold on to that thought. We, we, I'll definitely bring it up. Um, Rob, uh, your hand is up. Yeah, I was um, curious. I've got two questions. First of all, what types of institutions are using Anvil? Do we have data on that yet? Because as uh, Andrew Lee said, you know, there's the strength of Anvil is supposedly in the ability of everyone to use it. And so my big question then is, okay, so who is actually using it? Is it still those in the know who are really going to be firsthand you know, linked to people who are involved in the Anvil project, or are we starting to really see it starting to blossom outside of that? Um, 
Galaxy, for example, I think that took a while to catch on, and I'm just curious to see how Ambrose doing in comparison to something like the Galaxy project. And I was also interested in the persona idea that you had for um, different end users. I think one category that maybe we should add to that is retraining of the workforce. So NIH and HGRA in particular keeps on talking about retraining of faculty in genomics and data science. And so maybe that should be another persona that we should be trying to actively bring onto the Anvil um, campus, should we call it, to help aid in retraining the faculty for genomics and data science type um, uh, use. Yeah, I think one of the things we hope with the persona framework is that we can identify new personas. I think the retraining one is a, is a, is a brilliant sort of suggestion. And so the question is, how do we distinguish the retraining, what what would we do different if we're tra retraining somebody versus if we're training somebody from from scratch? And so I think that that's a cool idea, and we'd have to think how to do it. But I think it's a good one. I think typically someone who's going to be retraining, they're going to be probably more cautious. They're probably going to be more stuck in certain ways. And maybe I'm just talking about myself. I don't know. Um, but you know. You, Everyone knows, okay, if you imagine you were taken out of your current comfort zone and something asked to do or be expected to start learning something else, what would be the impediment to you learning that? What would stop you learning that? Like, I keep on thinking I should learn Python, but I don't have time. So, you know, I have to stick with transfer everything out or using Linux. So what, what's, the, what's the typical sort of impediments or challenges that researchers would have to learn a new skill like that you can then learn from that as to then how, how then we should think about maybe training uh, modules specifically targeting um, maybe older faculty or faculty who maybe are not from genomics um, areas. It's, this is related, I guess, to the retraining, but one of the things I'm seeing more and more in um, new faculty postings is the request, especially at teaching universities, to be implementing things like cures where you're bringing research into the classroom. And I think that's one of the things that we've been uh, talking about a lot as groups, both in the GDS and, and internally, is just how can we bring this kind of research to those kinds of institutions? And I think one strategy is targeting the faculty, because if the faculty don't actually know how to do the research, then it's hard for them to advise and mentor the students. So I think exactly you know, in line with what you're saying, Robert, about the retraining, I think it's just getting people accustomed to speaking language, to finding the collaborations and doing the research you know, on a platform like Anvil. So I, you know, I, I think that retraining and that, or even just you know, the, the first time training you know, is a very good point. Um, Andrew, looks like. <laughs> yeah, hard? yeah. the physical hand up. Uh, just to quickly add that uh, one of the notes I was making in preparation for this was as much as we're talking about modules where students are going to get their hands wet and get in, uh, I was struck to riff off Fred's point, which is uh, maybe we need a tour of somebody using Anvil. How do you go from recruiting patients to then collecting data to crunching numbers to seeing everything come up in the cloud? Because that way it would naturally then maybe fit for retraining of faculty and also just as an introduction even to students about what does this actually do uh, when you go from beginning to end. Yeah, that was actually very close to the comment I just put in the documentation, which is even though the documentation looks really nice, but you're starting off with, you know, how to create an account in a workspace before you've even shown somebody that sort of walkthrough of, Here's an example of analysis you can do that you don't have to sign up for. You don't have to worry about cloud credits. You don't have to, you just push a button and somebody will say, well, you know, here's the data set and here's how you get it. And here's the analysis I did. And here's the buttons I pushed. I mean, that sort of high level walkthrough before people have to invest in setting up an account and cloning workspaces and stuff. I think the energy of activation to get into using Anvil is still too high um, because it still, it still requires um, sort of a trust that if I spend the time to register and get workspaces set up, that it's going to be something I can use before there's any, anything I saw. There was a couple of workspaces that you would could be walked through, but you had to first clone the workspace, right? So there's a lot of upfront stuff you still had to do. I think that lowering that 
that energy of activation for understanding what Anvil can do for you, like was just mentioned, I think would, would be very, very useful. And I think it's a weakness now that there's still sort of that high level of energy of activation. I also wondered, um, it's a question, a comment, um, uh, how users are finding Anvil. Like, do you poll how people learn about Anvil and can you learn from that how to better maybe target groups that you're wanting to reach but are missing? Um, I, I, just that, that whole user um, acquisition uh, strategy. I'm just wondering if, if you could say a few more words on that. Uh, yeah, I think maybe I'll, I can respond to a couple of those. So there's two or three things there. One is, I think your point is well taken around billing and activation energy. I, you know, this is a, a deep across deep pilots and, and will help dot Anvil project across all these platforms. The thing that intimidates new users is billing. They, they, they get, you know, like that's, that's the scariest part of this whole thing for a lot of people. And so we've been thinking, you know, actively and one of the hopes for the future is really thinking through how do we support that ease of transition for people onto the platform so they can try something without feeling about billing. And it's a tricky problem. It's a heavy lift to sort of create a free tier or something like that, but it's something we would love to be able to do. Um, because, you know, just thinking back to the model that Tiffany showed of sort of user acquisition, you know, a choke point for us is really around getting your credit card in there and stuff like that. There are examples as Mike linked to one uh, of different walkthroughs and we can show people features workspaces but unfortunately, at the moment, if you want to start doing stuff on Anvil yourself, the very first step has to be you got to get your credit card in there. And, and we all know that that's a huge barrier to access. And so that's an infrastructure problem that, that outreach can only do so much to overcome. But, but, we would, but we agree that that is a key barrier we need to get people over the hump. Well, let me just say uh, that when, when Galaxy was first coming out, one of the reasons that um, I started using Galaxy is because you, you go to the site and you could click on this five minute video and Anton basically walked you through, here's how you do an RNA-seq analysis. Like you didn't have to do anything. All you had to do is watch him create the workflow, get the data in, push the button, and then watch the results come in. And just that simple five minute, like here's, here's how it works. You know, I immediately set up an account um, for that, but I didn't have to go through any of that because there was this nice nugget of walkthrough about how to do a very specific analysis that met my needs. Um, and so I was able to jump right in. I, I, I don't see that in the current Anvil book, getting started book. It's like introduction and then what does it cost? And I think that's that if there was something to, to there that was more look, here's, here's before you think about signing up or paying money, here's some examples of what it can actually do for you. Start with that rather than start with the, what does it cost? I think so, we, we've, we've moved into the, uh, the weaknesses and, and even threats uh, portion yeah. of the slide, but great. Saurav, yeah, please. Yeah, see, so, uh, since we are, so I was going to say that since we were talking about strength, the Anvil documentation is very nice, but I agree to all of the people I had in my notes uh, for that too, that I think it would be really helpful if instead of that much documentation, if we have short videos. So like uh, the previous speaker mentioned about uh, Galaxy, uh, I would also like to mention us about a software that I use frequently, which is IPA, Ingenuity Pathway Analysis. So if you, you don't need to subscribe or do anything to look at what it does. So if you go, to their website, they have multiple videos that you can go and learn, which gives you an idea of what you need it for and whether you need it actually, right? So which is uh, what people would like to know before they register or do something else. And I think that would be very helpful. I think the point is well taken that we could throw a couple of, we have several like really awesome video walkthroughs that we could put on the front page and put at the beginning of this book. The thing to really keep in mind though, is that, you know, a difference between us and say Galaxy is there is a Galaxy main, which is sort of a free cloud-based service. And so once you've been excited about doing something, you can immediately like press a button and start doing work for free. 
that currently is impossible with with Anvil and, and would take an engineering change to sort of make that happen. And I think it's something we should absolutely explore. And I'm, I'm, I'm with everybody on that. I, I would love to see that, but it's sort of something that's hard for us to, to do is the outreach team. So, so Jeff, that is why I mentioned about IPA. IPA is a very expensive software, like registration, $12,000, $13,000 per year. But you can go to the website and see like multiple videos to find out what it actually does and whether it would help you or not, even before you do anything. So I was, that's the reason I, I mentioned that. Um, lots of hands. Just, just because I think this was being um, communicated in the Zoom chat, but the, <clears throat> the, the, the getting started guide, I think hits at the, the people who have been convinced already that they want to start using the platform. And so it's trying to walk you through those step-by-steps. This is part of the larger outreach um, material. And if you go to the actual portal, um, we do have three videos that do highlight use cases, uh, highlighting on variant calling using GATK, doing GWAS um, analysis, and you know, getting into what goes into EQTL analysis. And so you know, I, I think one point that's well taken is that we, we are continually trying to find the proper way to organize this material so that it's easier for people to understand. Um, but you know. The, 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 these are definitely all great comments that we need to, you know, try and make sure that the message is getting across clearly. So uh, places that you uh, have for suggestions on, on redesigns are uh, very welcome there. And, and Fred, it might be um, interesting to know, like, who is asking these questions? Um, you know, something coming from Saurabh would, would, you know, given, you know, that he's at, you're at UTEP, right? Correct, Saurabh, I think, right? Okay, yeah. At University of Texas El Paso, right? Um, th that might be a very different question, or it might be a very different answer from you than you know, someone who's from somewhere else. Levi, sorry, you've had your hand up for a while, please. Levi, go ahead. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to chime in a little bit more about uh, the, the issues of cost and, um, and security, which have been raised, and only to point out that these are not just issues at like the individual investigator level that in my experience, there are policies codified at the university level um, around those things that are, that for me were, were like really prohibitively discouraging to using cloud resources. And I feel like, um, I, I mean, either my university is like worse than everywhere else um, for that, which sometimes I felt like, um, uh, or, we need to recognize that there are also institutional hurdles that um, that we need to think about how to overcome, or else whatever is done at the at the individual investigator level is going to take a long time to percolate up to like central ITs and purchasing departments. Levi, which which school are you at? And, and the reason I ask is because <laughs> IT support is very different at very different places. So. Yeah, I'm at I'm at City University of New York, CUNY. Okay. Um, so it's a pretty big college. I mean, it has like 20 campuses and, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, some hundreds of thousands of students, but, um, I can tell you that I was the first person to use a cloud servicing rebiller, uh, in, in my case, Onyx to, to pay for, uh, for Google cloud computing and to set up a strides account. And I know that because I had to broker, uh, negotiations between the Office of Legal Counsel and Onyx in order to get a contract that both sides could agree on so that I could use a third party rebiller. You know, it, it's, it was not, it was not easy. And I also had to like fill out security review forms where I had to pretend that I knew like what kind of encryption Anvil used and what kind of authorization system it used. And still in the end, I think I, I got away with that part because I said, well, I'm using publicly available data. I'm not using any um, you know, data collected at the university. So just, just to say, I mean, I went through like a substantial amount of effort just to be able to pay for and analyze data uh, on, on Anvil um, that there's no way I would have done if I weren't funded to work on the project. Um, and it'll be easier now for anyone else at CUNY who does it. And I imagine at the larger universities, 
it's already been done, but the, there's going to be a long tail of places where it's just, I mean, I think there was basically, there are policies that are meant to actively discourage faculty from using cloud computing. Yeah, and, and just to uh, chime in on uh, Andrew P's um, comment in the text, um, I wonder if Levi's problem would be similarly countered at other public institutions. Yes, and private institutions as well. Uh, it, it's not just, so, um, yeah. Just, just to chime in there that we had the same problem at Johns Hopkins, frankly, with some of these things, which is sort of embarrassing to say. Um, but one of the things we've thought about on our end, and I'm curious what the group thinks about this, is templated documents. You know, every everybody's going to have to do what Levi did at some level if they want to use cloud. I, I think, unfortunately, that's sort of like, and, and Titus and other people, you know, lots of people mentioned this. Are there things that we could create security documents, templates around what the Anvil is? You know, like, is there a packet that we could give to faculty that would make it easier for them to have broker those deals? You know, I, I don't think we can eliminate that step for universities. I just don't see that happening, but I wonder if we can make it easier. Uh, Jeff, if Jeff. I may come in briefly, I'm, um, I'm sorry if there's a video lag or a text lag, I'm halfway across the planet. But this particular problem right now is actually something that's being acknowledged at the NIH wide level and not just with Anvil or not just with our institute, but with NIH as a whole through the Office of Data Science Strategy. I mean, imagine if Johns Hopkins or SCUNY or UC Davis is having a problem getting a credit card to use the cloud. Let's consider the smaller places that are part of the GDSCN. Let's consider the places we haven't even reached out to yet. So really, I think part of the entropy that Carol and others mentioned is not just scientific, but also administrative. And, and here at NIH, we are giving lots of thought to how to work with purchasing agents or administrative officers to, to enable them to let the scientists or the researchers or the postdocs at their institutions use the cloud. So this is something we are taking very seriously. It's still early days yet, but uh, there's a lot of conversations at NIH shaping up around this topic. We're going to categorize that one as an opportunity, sure, Joe. Is that is that a fair uh, right now? Say? Frankly, uh, you, you know, uh, as the program person, uh, I'm I'm going to insist that my categorization not be taken as the one, but I see it as a weakness, frankly, uh, and an opportunity, but maybe a weakness and an opportunity at the same time. Definitely not a strength. Seems like there's a definite opportunity here for Anvil to do something to help researchers at institutions negotiate these challenges. And talk in the chat is about boilerplate documents, but I think maybe it'll take more than that. I think if we're relying on documents going back and forth between legal, there's going to be severe delays and that will impact projects. And maybe what we actually need is like a security officer who's part of the Anvil program who can actually assist and help researchers with these sorts of issues at their institutions with the immediate access to those elements of security protocols, et cetera, but I'm sorry, most researchers don't really know those things. So it, it seems like there's a definite opportunity there for a, a need for a, a position there to assist um, with, with research. So I, I think there's always going to be a con sort of clash, conflicts of interest between institutions wanting to keep hold of data with the idea that maybe they can monetize it. Uh, we see this being a HBCU a lot. Um, and the concept of open access, depending on who's paying for the data. Good point. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how common that would would, uh, would be at a different um, landscape, but uh, in general, that sounds like a, it's an issue that we all have. Um, John, uh, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, again, uh... As I said, I ran this uh, data science uh, training uh, workshop, and then one of the feedback or comment that we got from the student, some of them felt they were left out, that they were not advanced enough to participate in some of the uh, sections. So my question is, are this step-by-step uh, -step, uh, getting started with Anvil, does it have prerequisites considering that some students are uh, researchers may come from biology, computer science, mathematics, or statistics. So uh, are they prerequisite for using uh, Anvil, especially for the self-service uh, uh, individuals? Okay. 
Mike, I think that one's that one's for you. Prerequisites okay. for Anvil. Pre -pre prerequisites to get to get to become a user. Uh, Jeff, why don't you jump in? I mean, I'm happy to do it. Yeah. Um, so like the prerequisites in terms of the prerequisites at the university level or the prerequisites for like a, a individual student or faculty member, I think, you know, the, the No, I, I would say for, for a student or for anyone who wants to get started using Anvil. Yeah. So I think that there's, you know, there's two kinds of prerequisites, right? There's sort of the, the sort of technical and bureaucratic prerequisites. Like at the moment you kind of have to have somebody who's going to set you up on the system with a credit card and a billing account and all that kind of stuff. Assuming you have that, the prerequisites in terms of the ability to use it, you know, it's, it's the, the three biggest tools that I think I see students immediately trying to adopt would be Galaxy as a, as a first point because it sort of it tends to be a, a tool that gets used in early bioinformatics courses. Then R and Python, depending on, you know, like most stats courses will kind of adopt an R model and maybe computer science a little bit more Python. I'm, I'm sort of being like, you know, generalistic there, but but there's sort of one of those three main tools or kind of the, the main tools to, to be used. Um, there are other tools that people can do. They tend to be a little bit more advanced though. And so one of the things we're working on with the GSCN and other people is a collection of introductory examples that we can give to people, you know, that, that focus on those tools so that people can try them out. But sort of we're thinking like the, the main target audiences would be sort of people in a bio, entry level sort of biology bioinformatics class or entry level stats class or entry level computer science class could, you know, do that work on the anvil. Does that answer the question? I hope. Yes. I would also comment that um, a lot of this is sort of more of a cultural shift than a technology shift. You know, a lot of people, you know, are really, you know, quite excellent. And it, just as a sort of personal example, I'm teaching undergraduate course right now in genomics. And um, I've been, you know, I've been making assignments where they write their own workflows and, you know, and they've been incredibly successful at that. It's, you know, maybe that's not for everyone, but to me, the bigger bar barrier is just the cultural shift. You know, people are very comfortable using their own laptops or their own computers, just moving them just, you know, onto something new is a big barrier in itself. So it's, you know, it's, um, and it is a big shift and we need to help them to do so, but, it's, but there are ways to, to make a progress there that, that I think, Basically, anyone could overcome. Anyone can overcome. I'm, and I'm, I'm really, um, I was really pleased to see my undergraduates, you know, kind of figure out how to work through whittles and work through workflows. It, it is, it is doable to do so. Yeah, it seems like, um, like kind of the user research um, could be done, right? On like testing out the onboarding materials with uh, different people from different institutions uh, with different backgrounds to see, you know, where are people tripping up in, in the course at this point, or um, does this need to be explained a little bit differently uh, and ex be expounded upon because there's some assumption that we don't even see on how much knowledge somebody has coming in. Um, I know one thing that we're doing for like Anvil powered by Terra is we're sort of trying to replace our workshops that we that we usually do and take a lot of time to prepare for to present. Um, we're trying to replace those with uh, with courses with with um, MOOCs, and the idea would be that you could have. Um, these courses represent all of your one on 101 workshop basics and you know usually that can take like a, a, a while to to like present and go through but if we have them already in courses they can be you know reused by the actual people that are going to the workshops to like train other people because they can use the courses and then it also helps scale the number of workshops we can do so we can go to you know actually build relationships with different, uh, you know, groups and we can, we can go to places and be build relationships and actually like not only like teach, but also leave back, you know, something that someone else can take and use going forward. Um, so that's something that we're experimenting. We're going to be doing next year. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any thoughts on, on that or ways you think we should test um, the materials, um, I'll, I'll be thinking about that at least, so. 
um, I saw Titus and Mark's hands both go up. Uh, is this like, if you guys have a comment about what we're the current discussion, please go ahead and just unmute and, and go for it. Um, if it's a new question, then just hang on for one sec. But uh, Titus, Mark, current discussion or new question? Um, okay, great. Uh, Bill, go ahead and then Sora. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess as I've listened to the discussion, it, it seems like outreach is really taking two uh, buckets. One is where you have people that already know about Anvil and outreach has it's taken on the role of making it easier for those folks to get involved and get engaged and using the tool that they already see value in and they know about already. And an another bucket of outreach is really uh, to people who may only have nominal knowledge of, of what uh, Anvil is and, and how it can be useful to their work or, or their of their re, uh, research. So that, and to combine that, I really like the um, comments about reaching out to faculty because I was thinking, I, I work at Howard University. So how, what does it take to get a sophomore biology student at Howard University interested in using Anvil? And what, the, what does that process look like? What do you have to do to get to make that sophomore biology student how would say, I want to use Anvil for my project, for my thesis, for my summer work? Uh, and, and I was thinking that the, probably the best pathway may be through the faculty. For example, suppose you gave faculty instructional credits such that give them access to use Anvil in their classes and, 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 and by giving them access to use uh, Anvil in their classes, then they're the sophomore biology student, the one getting exposed to it. And that sophomore biology student then see some of the aspects that, 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 that he or she could use. And, and then it would kind of open up a window, a potential opportunity to get the, those students uh, involved. And another aspect also, just because you're a PhD student or a postdoc, a graduate student or postdoc, it doesn't mean that you uh, know all about uh, Anvil and, and know how to use it. And for example, suppose you are a graduate student or postdoc in an uh, experimental lab doing wet chemistry, so, so to speak. But an aspect of your work could really be enhanced or benefited by some of the resources that uh, Anvil can provide. How do you get that person knowledgeable enough about Anvil to say, that's a tool I need to use in my work? So, 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 so is, is, are, there, um, are there ways to, to, to reach out to the undergraduate level and also to the graduate and postdoc level? I, I know there are different pathways, but, but to reach out to, for example, if, if, if there's a, Postdoc, still so says a graduate student working on a PhD in in minor problems in biochemistry. That, that's traditionally a, a wet chemistry type work. So, 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 so um, say they're studying they're studying uh, mechanisms of diabetes. So, so is there a way that this student can understand that Anvil is a way of understanding? biochemical or genetic basis of disease processes. And that, that would turn on the lights and maybe I can use it to understand the disease process that I'm studying. So, so, so uh, those are two ways. I, I don't have real good suggestions on how to solve those, but I think solving those would broaden the footprint of access and interest in Anvil. I'll say those are amazing suggestions, and and uh, I would say that our, our initial effort we didn't I didn't get to talk about it too much because we were sort of blazing through lots of things the outreach team is doing. But the the closest to what you're talking about that we're doing right now is this GDSCN effort, and so there we're kind of getting faculty that are at these institutions and trying to build with them shareable open source curriculum. So say you're a faculty at Howard and you want to deliver this course to your you know, teach your course about 
uh, biochemistry, but you want to include a little bit of anvil in there, if there's already a pre-prepped lesson plan and some anvil credits, then you can take it off the shelf and share it. And, you know, then you tweak it how you like it and then share it back to the group and maybe a biochemistry professor somewhere else can use it. Yeah. So, so we're just on the beginning of building those curriculum. We have our first example, which we can probably paste a link to here on Galaxy using Galaxy like this. But our, our goal is to build more curriculum like that and then provide cloud credits. Again, the billing is always the place where it, it gets a little challenging, but we have some cloud credit programs that we could definitely use to support that kind of educational effort. So that's, that's great. Lots of things. Sorrow of Titus, Mark, yeah. and Levi. I actually wanted to thank Mike for sharing the document for his undergraduate course. It was very helpful. Uh, as Mike knows, it, it is more probably related to GDSM. I teach uh, both undergraduate and graduate bioinformatics, and a lot of tools are used in those programs. So I can easily incorporate Anvil into those, and students can start using that if it is made. Feel free to reach out if you ever want to discuss more. Yeah, sure, Mike. I, I would. We need to do this offline. I mean, we. I had shared my course document with you, probably syllabus before when Shujo had introduced, but then we can do this offline of this discussion. And um, really good participation. Are, are there any discussants who uh, haven't had a chance to talk or, or write in the chat yet that um, that, that would uh, take this opportunity? Hope we've, hope we've gotten to everybody. Uh, yeah, sure, Titus, go ahead, please. Sid, uh, as, a, as a strategy, you need to let the silence become uncomfortable if you want people who haven't spoken to speak up. Well, here we go, 15 I'm, seconds. I'm just, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just no, kidding. You're I mean, right. I'm not I'll... kidding, but, but you know. Um, so, um, so, so we have lots of, I have lots of experience in, in my group and my various efforts with the various modalities of cloud signup. We've been doing this for over a decade. We've been through this with Amazon and Google Compute. We now go, we now go through a progression for example, we start with Binder, which which offers a free R Studio server. No sign up. Literally, click a link. Boom, it's it's there, uh, and that's for up to three hour workshops. We use Amazon and classes. We use Amazon Web Services IAM for like three hour ish things where we can create accounts and delete them easily and, and assume the billing responsibilities. No credit card needed. SSH key is sometimes needed, which can be a problem. And then we do we we support group accounts and individual sign up for for more than three hour. You know week long, two week long and, and longer. Um, and the thing is you want all of these working, right? Because they legitimize peripheral engagement uh, and provide a pathway to, while providing a pathway to increased get engagement. And the cool thing, and I think this fits for Anvil as well, transitioning between them isn't actually that hard, right? You have our studio across all of them. You have the command line across all of them. And so it's actually a great learning experience for the user. They get, oh, I can do something in our studio. Oh, and now I can log into an account and have a persistent R Studio for a bit. Yay! And then, oh, now I can like log out and log back in a week later, and it's all still there. Um, the challenge right now seems to be that Anvil doesn't support uh, many of those modes of of of, um, of engagement around new accounts and so on. And that sounds like something that the tr this group, the training group, wants, would like to see, but that isn't supported on the infrastructure side. So I just want to make sure clear that that's both an opportunity and a threat. You can align technology, you can align the training side with the technology side of Anvil across all these training modalities and, and, and potentially transform uh, uh, both Anvil's user base and the, 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 um, and the common practice of data science. The threat is that if this doesn't happen, and then if, if you don't have that alignment where you can do easy and cheap sign up, then, then that transformation may not occur. This also ties into this other thing that I, I think I threw into the, both the threat and the opportunity side, which is the sort of threat that Anvil becomes a dead end. And what I mean by that is none of us want to be in a situation where we put a semester of training into a student, for example, and then they walk out and they can no longer use what we've trained them in. This happens a lot with technology. Um, and I like the fact that Anvil's built on a bunch of really standard technologies, right? Like the workflow systems, the data analysis systems, R, Python, Bioconductor, all, all is wonderful. I think a, a long-term threat for Anvil would be to make sure, or a long-term opportunity for Anvil would be to double down on that, like we're doing everything with standard platforms as much as possible. And there is very little, only the necessary stuff 
around data use and, and privacy and so on is, is really specific to Anvil and, and Terra and Gen3 and the other, other platforms you're using. So um, I put all that into the document. That, that's my biggest sort of threat opportunity dichotomy for, for Anvil at the moment. Great, um, and, and uh, Tiffany is uh, uh, advising us. Yeah, we're, so we're, we're down to 10 minutes, so we'll probably spend some time doing the, the, uh, summaration, the summation of the slide. Um, but Mark and Levi, please go ahead. You have your hands up. So. so my apologies if I missed this, but I don't think I've heard anything about the NHGRI training grants during this discussion. And it seems like that the trainees on those students, right, are the, the next generation of, of leading genomics researchers. And so I'm wondering if Anvil's done anything to try to reach out to enlist those trainees as Anvil users. You know, for example, I, I know they have an annual meeting. Um, has anything been presented at that annual meeting to try to get them involved? Uh, Mark, I'll take that one. That is a, that is a wonderful, insightful comment. I, I happen to be the person that is part of both the Anvil training and outreach group and a member of the extramural training team here at the Genome Institute. So this uh, mark is the first year that we feel the Anvil is in a position to be put in the hands of trainees. So literally, uh, and uh, Teddy or uh, Carolyn or others on the call, please feel free to chime in. But literally starting this year, we are in the process of integrating Anvil into what could be used by our trainees. You know, For example, at the trainee meeting next year, there will be presentations on the Anvil, there will be use cases, so you're making this comment, right? As we internally here said, uh, now I think we are ready to put Anvil in the hands of the trainees. So watch out by this time next year, hopefully we have many trainees using the Anvil. Great, glad to hear it. Thank you. My pleasure, Mark, thank you. And it helps if I unmute. Last comment from Levi, and then we'll move on to uh, filling out our slide. I just wanted to respond to, to Bill's uh, comment about getting students using Anvil and, and say that um, thanks to this uh, Deep Pilots uh, program from the, uh, the outreach team, I'm doing that with uh, my class this fall and they're not um, advanced computational students. They're epidemiology and biostatistics students, um, but they need to use uh, our studio for for their analysis, um, and it, it's I think it's been really successful. I've had high uptake of it and really no complaints at all about it. And I've had more and more students start using it as the semester goes on, just because as soon as they have some problem on their laptop, I say, "Well, use Anvil then." <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it, it's it's. I think it's not that hard to do. Um, and I'm, I'm working on trying to make an easy set of instructions for other, um, for other uh, professors to follow. But the big thing is they're just, yeah, being some, some money to uh, put on a workspace so that you know, all students have to do is sign up and give me the email address they used to sign up. And then they're a member of the workspace and it tells them how to get started. These are all um, really, really uh, useful comments. Um, I, I think we're, um, why don't we switch over to, um, Chris, if you can put up the, the slide, um, if you're ready for that, and we'll just kind of decide as a group um, if we need to change anything. Great, we'll go there. Yes, just a second here. Sure. There have also been a really um, helpful thoughts going into the notes document, so I was not able to pull all of those in yet. Is that sharing? Yes, I, I see your slides. Okay. Screen. Is that legible? Yes. Oops. Okay, do you want me to just kind of run through some of what is captured and then we can see what's missing or? Yeah, okay. and if, if uh, you know, if uh, we have uh, something is lost in translation, please uh, anybody chime in and uh, yeah. you don't have to raise your hand just uh, yeah. So you kind of the low activation energy relative to purchasing um, computing resources was one of the strengths. The ability to really get more geographic diversity of users. Heard a number of people commending the deep pilots and other, other sort of um, forms of direct engagement and the new user credits. Also, the documentation and the forums. Are there other things that are missing here? 
I would just add in uh, the quality of just engaged participants, you know, to see so many people coming back for different meetings and being engaged in all the other uh, outreach events. So supportive network, supportive engaged participants. Should we qualify more about the credits for new users? Because you that's not, I, I was just thinking that's, um, that this is, is this referring to the program, the new program? Oh, provided by Google. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. I would add like AC2 to that comment, right? Okay. Weaknesses, <laughs> the uh, opposite here, the high activation energy compared to using something you already have. Um, the fact that there are so many different tools and capabilities that supporting them all becomes challenging. The build, the cost, the actual dollars that spent, you have to spend, and then the difficulty in um, actually being able to pay those dollars. So it's the lack of a free usage tier, you need to create an account. The lack of video documentation, some of the intrinsic difficulty in platform integration, um, lack of a lower slope entry point, and a lack of advertising awareness. GDSCN was called out. Chris, I, I would, I would, um, oh, I'm sorry, Robert, go ahead. I, I was just going to add in one point and that is the, the, the fear that it might be a dead end um, utility. You know, if say NIH decided in five years it didn't want to support Anvil, people would then be very worried that they've invested all this time and energy into switching over to using an, the Anvil ecosystem I, I don't know what the long-term support, support plan is by NIH, so um, that, that needs to be better communicated as well. Um, so the thing that I wanted to add is, uh, I think there's, there's, I wanted to expand on the lack of free tier. One is credit cards specifically are a really big barrier. It's not just creating an account, it's, it's credit cards. And the other is the need for security review that's usually tied to putting in a credit, an institutional credit card number. Um, creating accounts, everybody's happy to make a throwaway account on a new service. I mean, approximately. It's it's the yeah. Okay. The opportunities. Um, heard a lot about retraining faculty in data science and Anvil potentially being a, a place for that. But also recognizing their specific perspectives. Just that everyone's encountering these barriers to using the cloud, and maybe Anvil can help provide some materials that are standard um, and just awareness, normalizing all this. Opportunity to kind of conduct research on how people are discovering and using Anvil. Opportunity to normalize the use of the cloud for the next generation of researchers to reach faculty and provide resources to really integrate um, Anvil into coursework, under special undergraduate coursework. Some discussion of like Titus's comment of oops, different um, scales for signing up, user engagement, course documentation. Looks like we are about to exit this group. Yeah, there's retraining, opportunities for retraining current workforces is really, was really uh, strong in my view my memory. I think recognizing we're about to leave here. Um, Sid, any last words you want to wrap up? I can... No, I think this is, uh, this is awesome. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll see you guys back in the main session. And uh, this is really helpful. I, I uh, uh, looking forward to, to uh, hearing from this group again in the future. Thanks everyone yeah. for the comments in the um, Google Doc. You can keep them coming um, briefly after this. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.